can do it. You 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 can do it. Yay! Super good. Okay. So close. We are so close to the finish line. We are like right there. Everything's gonna be totally fine. Um. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> my my father used to tell me when I was complaining that things were getting really hard at school. He always used to say. So my I totally privileged kid. Both my parents are professors. They used to say <laughs> that you can stand in a pool of shit up to here so long as you know when you can get out. And I'm not sure that I fully agree, yeah. but <laughs> knowing when the finish line is, is really, really helpful. That's Kimmy Schmidt advice there. Is it? You can do anything for 10 seconds. <laughs> and then just restart the count. Yay. Okay, cool. Um, Okay, wonderful. Winston Churchill had advice about going through hell. Yeah? When you're going through hell, yeah. keep going. Keep going. <laughs> do not keep stop. Going. Okay. Thank you, Caribou. Thank you, Caribou. Wonderful. Um, okay, we have some very cool things uh, to, um, to um, discuss and think about. I hope you're going to like this one. This is going to be good. Um, okay, but... Mammoth and Ice Fish! Two things. Two things. Any questions about the EPP or the seminars or anything like that will get likely more quickly answered by a knowledgeable person if you send them to the course email address. Mm. Um, so that's where all of those types of things should go um, so that you get a, a more knowledgeable and speedier answer. <laughs> uh, this is, a, as you know, a monster course. So there are three of us that teach it um, and, uh, and we kind of have uh, sort of divided out our responsibilities and, and that kind of deal. So that's how that works. Mine is dog videos. <laughs> Smith does dog videos. Okay. Um, uh, and the other thing, what did I want to say? You can do it. Oh, you can do it. You can yeah. Do it. You can do Lecture it. 20, the audio did not work. And many of you have been writing to us, which is delightful. We're always happy to hear from you. Um, we're happier if we can help you. And we have been able to help you in responding that the audio didn't work. And there's nothing we can do about it. Thankfully, though, we do have closed captioning, which is like the plan B for when the audio doesn't work in the case uh, of this particular thing. Obviously, we have closed captioning for like a whole bunch of other reasons, um, but it can be used um, to, uh, to get through uh, technological glitches such as this one. So you can watch the slides, you can watch us, and you can say, what did Google think they were saying? <laughs> I know, I know. It's not perfect. <laughs> but, but I'm anyway. glad it's there yeah. for all of the reasons. For all of the reasons. And okay. this one is not even the top three. Okay. It's, there we go. This is fun. Um, this Okay, so hopefully this is, again, going to blow your mind at awesomeness and the fact that different things can happen in different situations given the same pressures, uh, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, just want to take care of this at the start. The next topic test, it's the third. Is that correct? It is the third. Remember in the the um, welcome page, the landing page for course link for this course, there's course schedule, the PDF on the top left on the menu bar. Yeah. And it, all that kind of crazy good information is there. And that's where I check when someone asks that question. And I'm like, oh, hell, when is that? I Friday, know. usual schedule. <gasps> Friday the third. No. Oh, right. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> It does. It means it's topic to hit test day. Um, yeah. Oh, that's good. The true test is reading the closed captions. So actually, wouldn't that be, that would be a really good topic test to be like, we speak it and see what comes out. <laughs> yeah. Maybe okay. that's a bad idea. Is it a bad idea? Well, it's, it's an idea, but maybe not a good one. <laughs> Okay, no surprises in the topic test, exactly the same type of stuff in terms of like the format and the way that we test and everything again. So this is like, hopefully you're going to be even more comfortable in terms of like the stress associated with the unknown. Um, hopefully that will reduce and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to um, do that well. Same kind of inclusive hours, like yeah. much more than you um, than you need for the test that we've for the for the yeah. topic test that we've designed. Same kind of open book, um, open internet. Yeah. Uh, don't. Yeah. Yeah. The same don'ts. Yeah. Don't um, share. <laughs> if you like the way that we test, um, share share your stories loudly um, because. 
<laughs> we are we are currently experiencing quite a bit of resistance uh you know the whole force back to campus coming up um and uh, we are resisting what are we resisting we're resisting going back to campus just to go back to campus because we want you to have three hours for a midterm yeah. uh, we want you to be able to sign in whenever you want we don't want to have to force you to do all of this in 45 minutes sitting next to each other while somebody's like breathing and coughing and like jiggling around in their seat um, but anyway, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm happy with the way things are going. If there's coughing, it's me, and we're on the other <laughs> side of this. Uh, yeah, we're safe. <laughs> quite an, an M100, we'll call it, mask of the interpipes. Cool. Okay. Amazing. Comments about the closed captioning on the lectures. Uh, partner used to do live captioning for lectures for people with accessibility needs, and much better, more accurate than Google. Yeah. Yes. You're and, right. It yeah, is. And we are we are bouncing between systems. Um, AI systems and Google is the best that we've found so far that can yeah. do it because uh, yeah it needs to be there yeah the other thing is if you do it through zoom you can do it live you can see the closed captioning live but it doesn't record it on the recording which is like zoom zoom you had one job yeah it does do a transcript but again like it's anyway a whole yeah. bunch of pros and cons that I'm learning about and if you know of better systems let us know we will continue to learn okay. as we go and so that's it. Yeah, that's it. No. Hemoglobin. Are they interesting molecules? No, not at all. <laughs> that is my position. Oh, oh my goodness, they are interesting molecules. I don't need oxygen. No. Okay, quick, quick shout out on to the uh, course chat. What does hemoglobin do? And did you spell it with an E or an hemoglobin? <laughs> what does hemoglobin do? Let us know. Let us know. Quick, you can Google it. Figure it out. Let us know. It's Irish, right? Hemoglobin? <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Bonds with oxygen. Transports oxygen in the blood. Very good. Yeah. So, it, it, to me, it's bananas. How many things? Thank you, Liv. That's perfect. Oxygen transport. And now we have it documented on the video as well. So, well done. Okay. It's bananas to me how many carrier molecules, the vital stuff that we need, actually are required. Okay, so we need carrier molecules for all sorts of things. We need carrier molecules to take fat from our store. Why am I bringing up fat? Is it maybe because I spent a lot of time thinking about fat? Carrier mm -hmm. molecules to bring fat from our fat stores into our muscles. Well, we need carrier molecules for all sorts of things. Wait till get to my bias. You, th you brought up the fat because you think about fat a lot. I bring up the fact that this is a very vertebrate-centered lecture because uh -huh. we're talking about hemoglobin. Take 2700 next term and we'll learn about all of the other oxygen carrying <laughs> molecules that the animal kingdom has come up with and this is maybe the most oh. boring one and oh, it's amazing. Oh no. Take and the it's purple amazing. one. Take the chrome colored one. Okay. Green blood, Green purple blood, blood. blue blood. <laughs> okay. So, um, hemoglobin and woolly mammoths in the same lecture, right? Yep. Okay. We Perfect. want to talk a little bit about hemoglobin. We want to talk about it in the context of uh, hemoglobin in a cold environment. The best animal to talk about it <laughs> with, about is the woolly mammoth. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about the evolution of the woolly mammoth. We should, okay. because it's pretty amazing. Our body is a bog of very kind and sharing cells and bacteria. That was actually the original title of the uh, John Mayer song. <laughs> okay. My body is bog of very kind okay. and sharing cells and bacteria. You know what? Uh, what do you know about mammoths? Write it down. Write it here on this screen, if you can, or pop it in the chat. Yeah, Everything and we're going to see know. whether or not, if you're having Ice Age flashbacks, what you know <laughs> about mammoths. Has it come from Ray Romano? Big. Polly, thank you. Yep, that's Really it. good. Okay. Everything that you know. All Put it things. on the screen. All the thing. It's extinct. Extinct. extinct, extinct. Wooly. Good. <laughs> <laughs> extinct. Extinct. Harry. Good. Dead. Good. Extinct, LOL. Now that's a little judgy. Dead. They are extinct. Friends with Sid the Sloth. Large feet. We used to eat them. Yes, predators. Yeah. Large mammals with tusks. Very good. What's in the yellow? Uh, big Social. tusks. Social. I love that. Social. Yes. Really nice. Oh, it's too bad we don't have time to show videos of Jacqueline Gill and stuff. Yeah. Large and in charge. <laughs> They are woolly friends with saber tooths and sloths, contemporaries. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay, that's great. Endotherm, thank you. Mwah! Big tusks. And apparently delicious. Related to elephants, question mark. 
Are they related to elephants? This is great. This is great. Well adapted to cold temperatures. Good. If we go back far okay. enough, everybody is. Yay! Okay. We know a lot of stuff about woolly mammoths. So this we is don't... great. Yeah. Moving on. on. ice fish. <laughs> okay. Uh, well adapted to glacial environments, but not to human colonization. Very nice. Floofy. Yes. So floofy. Okay. Perfect. Woolly mammoths. Here's some other stuff that we know about woolly mammoths. Um, they are previously pretty darn common to here um, and to Eurasia. So they are definitely a northern my, hemisphere. My Asia? Eurasia. Um, definitely northern hemisphere. Uh, definitely cold adapted. Several morphological adaptations to the cold, like a lot of them, okay, in order to be able to survive. Uh, they were uh, extirpated for most of their range. Um, so there was like sort of a mass reduction in the population size. Think bottleneck, think all sorts of genetic troubles afterwards for a while. Um, and then finally, uh, extinctions, uh, the extinction event didn't happen that long ago. In an evolutionary perspective, it was the wee blink of an eye. That's right. So, wow, right? Only 1,700 years. And that population, there is lots of evidence to suggest that that population was not a healthy population. Life was not good to be, you know, for the last few remaining woolly mammoths um, as a result of this massive decline in, in genetic variation. So that kind of ties it all together. Causes of extinction include probably all the things. Um, and certainly humans uh, didn't help, um, but that may not have alone uh, resulted in the extinction. It's probably compounded a bunch of different ver different factors. And you want to take us through here? Well, are they related to elephants? So if we look at this, this is a, uh, a phylogeny. What is with the tree-based thinking? It is the way to get to all of the things, <laughs> ecological or physiological. It is the context. So... Are they related to elephants? Yes. So this time we have time, in this case, we have time proceeding from left to right on the base of that slide. And you can see there's like proto-elephants over there, the Paleomastodon in the Eocene and the Oligocene. And if we take a jump over to look at the tips of those trees, and you see only two tips extend into the green border, the which is today. And you can see the mammoth, second from the top, trying to lean in and doing the sprinter lean at the tape to be like, I am almost here. <laughs> and that's the mammoth. Now, mammoth and mastodon, very different. And different. you can see here beneath the two uh, elephants, Asian and African, very deeply divergent, um, yeah. not related to each other, much more distantly related to each other than are the Asian and the African elephant. Cool. So the other thing that I want to call attention to is that this is a simplified tree of even the extant species. So this is a snapshot and our best guess at the diversity of the extinct lineages. And for instance, it's also conflating some genera and some species. So there's multiple species of mammoth. And we now know there are multiple species of elephant in Africa, yeah. which is amazing Fantastic. and also tragic because it uh, means that some of them are much more uh, likely to be uh, extinct in your lifetime yep. um, than they were before. Yep, just like we're also recognizing many more species of giraffe. Many species Amazing. of giraffe, many species of orca. And of course, right? Of course. So, yeah. yeah. No surprise, but absolutely wonderful. Okay. Look familiar? So if we take a look at the history of the range expansion of the mammoth, um, we see kind of a similar pattern, right? Um, pretty similar to our pattern, the sort of range expansion of humans, although very much before um, that of humans. We're talking millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. Um, the oldest known uh, record of uh, a modern day human is about 195,000 years old um, and uh, certainly then mammoths uh, and all sorts of related species were, were uh, into North America much earlier than that. So it isn't this like co-evolution of, uh, of range expansion. They were already there. They didn't come across. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, kind of cool though. Following similar patterns, 
for probably very similar reasons, right? There's a bridge. There's you're a, a bridge. You're a terrestrial thing. That's right. You, you're endemic to this continent. You're going to move out of it into other continents following, you know, sort of climatic and habitat changes, right? Okay. Good. And we did overlap, which, oh my goodness, how cool would that be? B, but there is actual written evidence of this in cave drawings and things like this. These are field notes. These are notebooks, exactly. These are the original field books of... It gives me shivers. I know, and, like, and I've been to these caves. When we visited those ones, the ones where there are handprints, yeah. and they're all right-handed. I can't even say this, I'm going to choke up with saying it, but they're all right-handed. And then there's a left-handed that's like, I'm left-handed too. Yay! <laughs> Yeah, uh, Smith's a pretty sentimental guy. Um, <laughs> so then but, over the barrier I go, I'm going to touch that one. I'm going to touch it. No, it, it is quite remarkable to see these things if you ever have the opportunity. Um, it, it does kind of bring you to tears. Um, but seeing sort of these recorded large herbivores, these large species on these caves, um, is indicative not only of their existence and observation by humans, but also of their importance, right? Humans draw things that are usually pretty important to them. Um, and so you're absolutely correct to, to say that there was hunting of them in some way, that there were these interactions with humans, which is wonderful. What cave did, were we in? Uh, I don't know which one. I forget which one. I was in Lascaux, mm -hmm. and then I was in Fond de Gome, which is like... 30,000 years old, which is so big. You can't go there anymore, though. But anyway, lots and lots of, of these um, types of records have been kept by humans, and we are currently preserving them, which is really good, but it does mean that it is harder to go and see them because the carbon dioxide that we breathe out um, can damage the actual paint on the wall. Yep. Let okay. alone the lights that we bring in with our flashes and our... And exactly. The the yeah. floating yeah. spores of fungus and algae that then grow upon them and yeah yada, yada. Exactly. exactly lots of comments about uh drawings in our own continent on lake yeah. superior up near yeah. peter patch um petroglyphs yeah, yeah exactly um okay so who caused the extinction ray romano or humans ray romano <laughs> So multiple factors, we've already said this, right? Um, but certainly hunting was one of the pressures on the population. Yeah. Um, and we know that, you know, if it's subsistence hunting of a population that is healthy with no other pressures, it's probably not going to lead them to extinction. Um, so certainly there were other things. So that what were kind going of stresses on. might there have been? Uh, lots of different stresses. Um, but let's talk about the amazing adaptations that evolved in the context of stresses. Mm -hmm. So hemoglobin, what does that have to do with mammoths? Well, it has to do with mammoths just like it does, as you've noted in the chat and on the screen with all mammals. It has to do with how we are able to carry oxygen and to oxygenate our blood that association between the hemoglobin and the oxygen and then how well we can pass it into the tissues where the work is being done because that critically in that last bullet you can see there and in the bottom right hand little squiggly cartoon of a relationship the release of oxygen into the tissues doing the work is sensitive to temperature and these mammoths existed at temperatures that are I think uh, using an SI unit, they are friggin' cold. <laughs> really, okay. R RFC. So the colder you are, the harder it is to offload oxygen from your hemoglobin. And these mammoths are consistently in cold places, touching cold substrates, right? Cold ground, um, making it really difficult to offload hemoglobin where it needs to be if those places are colder. So... Yeah, there's the evidence. <laughs> they got feet. They've got feet at on the ice. End of, suspiciously <laughs> at the end of their legs and almost always underneath their knees. Okay, so how then if hemoglobin doesn't work very well in the cold and if the feet of mammoths are consistently colder, how does a mammoth survive? You start by sequencing their nuclear genome. Why would you do that? Well, 
we would do it a now we would do it because we have the ability and so a lot of this is driven by technological capacity that as we develop so this paper of uh, which you can get a link to later on by just clicking on this page is relatively recent and the the carrot at the end of the stick there's some of the te some of the people that would have been the car their carrot was doing the thing with the tool the new tool that they couldn't do before but the functional carrot is to say, okay, within this nuclear genome is the blueprint for how they would have constructed these proteins and how and what would those proteins have looked like? And would they have just been like their most extant recent ancestor? That's right. Cool. All these really good questions. So basically the idea was that it was thought that something had to be up with the hemoglobin in order to be able to get over this particular challenge of temperature. Um, so what they did was they extracted DNA from, uh, from a mammoth sample because mammoth DNA is still existing on the planet, which is amazing. And in fact, it's even somewhat at risk. The yeah. extinct DNA of mammoths is at risk as the permafrost melts. That's because right. you can find on the YouTubes lots of video of uh, Russian people using powerful like firefighter hoses to blow out um, mammoth tusks uh, out of the melting permafrost because the mammoth tusks can be a source of ivory in the yeah. for people that do not want to Hunt contemporary elephants. elephants. So that's kind of good, but it's also kind of bad. It's also kind of bad. Okay, but basically what they did was they sequenced mRNA, they made hemoglobin of mammoths, which is bananas. And that's it in the tube. And there's a link underneath. You can there. go watch a video of the, uh, the lead researcher, Kevin J. Campbell, is currently on strike at the University of Manitoba. Yeah. And he's very proud of his efforts. Oh boy, oh boy, he is. It's a little, a little, which is why we're not going to watch the yeah, video. Yeah, you can watch it later. He's a little too proud of his efforts, but nah, it is really cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, they made woolly mammoth hemoglobin. Alpha and beta. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What level of organization? Molecular. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Woolly mammoth hemoglobin had properties that allowed it to function in cold extremities and appendages. What might we then predict about woolly mammoth hemoglobin? So if this is true, if woolly mammoth hemoglobin had properties that allowed it to function in cold extremities and appendages, despite having a warmer cold temperature, core temperature, what might we predict about that hemoglobin? Give us some predictions that follow from that hypothesis. You can use them in the chat. You can sketch a graph if you want <laughs> or put on your, uh, your text prediction on the screen. There's some popping up in the chat already. More flexible structure. Yeah. More effective than our own. Nice. Yep. Good. Measure metabolic rate. Okay. What else? Aren't they trying to grow a mammoth? They totally are. The question is, should they? And we will ask you soon. Uh, we're totally running out of time, though. Yeah. Okay, but mammoths are cool. Okay, what else? Mm -hmm. Potentially carries more oxygen. Yeah, That's follow fascinating. That. Follow that. Uh, not as effective as brown fat. Oh, good. Antifreeze. Mm -hmm. eh, large. Think about that Wider figure. functional that, range. That oh, cartoon? I like that. I like that. Yeah. Wider functional range. That's good. Remember the cartoon from the earlier slide that showed the increase in efficiency and then a drop? Yeah. That's with our hemoglobin. That's right. You expect right. the same thing. Super, super good. Okay. We've got some things. Okay. So how about starting really simple? Okay. We might predict, you, so uh, some of your things are good. Wider functional range, good, yes, yep. right, perfect. Carries more oxygen, amazing. I'd never thought of that, but you could test that, right? Okay, woolly mammoth hemoglobin structures will be more similar to that of Arctic mammals than to the hemoglobin structure of closely related tropical elephants. That's another prediction that you can make from this. Multiple good predictions. It's not just one that's going to come from this hypothesis. That's great. So we might think instead of, uh, we might be looking, as that says, for convergent evolution. Mm. Okay. So you can set up an experiment. You can analyze the structure 
of the hemoglobin and then measure the ability of the reconstructed hemoglobin to bind over a wider temperature range. Remember one of you said wider functional range. So good. Okay. So imagine that. Oh, Smith. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. Imagine that hemoglobin was more efficient at cold temperatures than elephant hemoglobin. Imagine that he mammoth hemoglobin uses similar mechanisms as other Arctic mammals. So yes, it is more efficient at offloading oxygen in colder temperatures due to very small little differences in the protein sequence. Does this represent shared ancestry or convergent evolution if other arctic mammals also have the same type of adaptation stamp it for me you can do it 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 you can good yes Yes, it is an example, very likely an example of convergent evolution because it doesn't share a lot of other things, <laughs> right? So if they shared more traits as well, then we would be like, oh yeah, maybe there's something, you know, like elephants evolved independently twice. Um, Vultures but, did it. Why not elephants? Yeah, it, I, exactly, right? Like it has happened, but way more likely, especially yeah. if it's the only trait that they share in common, um, is going to be due to convergent evolution. Super good. So here we go. Asian Evelyn, uh, Asian <laughs> elephant. It's very hard not to do woolly, that. I know. Uh, and the woolly mammoth do have these small differences in conformation that allow for the offloading of, of oxygen uh, more efficiently in cold temperatures in the case of the woolly mammoth. And some of you in the chat have noted um, that you were, you've been talking about this. This is, has been in the news, literally this term, this was in the news. But this is George Church, who's a biologist at uh, Harvard or some, some small school in the East Coast of the U.S. He's a geneticist, and he has found money, like, like internet startup tech money, uh, for this company. The link's down there called Colossal, because <laughs> they're not white men thinking with whatever it is that they're... <laughs> compensating for but they have called this company colossal and they're going they're attempting to use uh, CRISPR editing technology to edit the DNA of Asian elephant embryos to introduce woolly mammoth traits that we know about including the hemoglobin uh, from the sequencing jobs that we have done earlier from extinct juvenile and so this is essentially going to be a hybrid and they're proposing that it's a good idea not because they could but because hybrid animals, they're proposing it in the light of climate change. Hybrid animals might help the, the maintenance of permafrost because trampled ground is more easily frozen than soft ground. And they think that it would also help the transition back to the steppe in the high Arctic from mossy tundra to grassy fields. And so therefore more carbon dioxide storage. I think there are some, uh, well, let's see what you think. If, um, is this a good plan? <laughs> Is this a good plan? Mm-hmm. Bad idea. Seems like such a bad idea. To what Have end? we learned nothing from Jurassic Park? <laughs> what about the other environmental conditions? Oh yeah, they want to release them. Yes. Yeah, oh yeah. Yep. Into the wild. Roaming woolly mammoths. Yep. As though a whole bunch of American hunters aren't going to come and just take them down in the first Yeah, in the so first they're going to keep, yeah. It's going to be a disaster. There's so many other, so one more click of the slide, and there's, you can, you can annotate, there's a spot where you can annotate on this screen if you. What am I doing? Click. Oh, okay. So. Yeah. Should we? Yes! Yeah. Oh my goodness! Don't they want to release them on indigenous land? Of course they do. Yes, because yeah. all of North America is indigenous land, but more specifically in indigenous communities. Terrible! Yeah. Yeah, there's so many things that it seems awfully simplistic from an ecological and a sociological and an anthropological yeah. perspective to me. It's, it's the, might we? Sure. And, yeah. then, and then from an economic perspective, I think about, I think about all of the species that are still here that are hanging on, that could benefit perhaps from yeah. the maintenance and the preservation of habitat. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. 
I, I, I hear you. I want to pet one too. I definitely think it's cool. Scientifically, sure. it is so cool. Like the, you, um, you saw yeah. me crying describing drawings of it. So like the idea that we or our children could stand beside awesome. near a mammoth is, would yeah. there'd be bawling. Are we going to do it well? No. Are we going to make good decisions about it? No. <laughs> All of those things. Could CRISPR be used for way more sort of human important medical things? Yes. Right? Well, um, CRISPR can anyway. do anything. Yeah. Okay. Just don't hire Newman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A world can't handle the power of the mammoth. I agree with you. I think scientists need to take ethics the, courses. Yes. What, yeah, they clearly, we all should. Yes. We all should. Um, what did the person say earlier? The power of the big... That was a good phrase earlier. That was a good phrase? Yeah. Okay, cool. Anyhow, okay. But, uh, we digress and oh we move on. Because we got more cool stuff. Because we have more cool stuff to tell you now. We I, might not get all the way through this one. We'll try. If, yeah, okay, so we... You can do it, no. you can do it, you can do it, you can yeah. do it. Yeah, okay, so do we it. told you about hemoglobin adaptation in the context of a cold environment, okay? What if I told you that there are more cold environments around the world and then more cool things related to hemoglobin? And that cool thing is in the truly amazing, equally as interesting, ice fish. Yeah, whatever. Oh, come on. No, this is good. The Antarctic ice fish. It's like a there stickleback. Are six... <laughs> it's a little fish. Okay, so there are 16 species of ice fish. It is the dominant taxon in the Southern Ocean, of in Antarctica, fishes. of the fishes, okay? not of the animals. Okay, it is like a super popular one. You're yeah. not allowed to eat them, but I've seen people eating them. They live in waters that are really, really cold. And they're weird. And they're beautiful. Look beautiful, at this. Beautiful, there beautiful. we go. Okay. And <laughs> they don't have hemoglobin, like. Nothing. Like they just hold their breath? <laughs> <laughs> There's no hemoglobin. It's a vertebrate with no hemoglobin. And okay? just in case some of you are thinking, maybe this is like what Smith was talking about with other animals, other inverts, where they have other oxygen-carrying molecules. It's even more cool because no. No. They just... They just don't. Like nothing. Okay. So no or non-functional red blood cells. Hemoglobin gene has been lost. It isn't even there anymore. Very high blood volume, large blood vessels, costly circulation, which is much less efficient. And look, down here in uh, the box labeled A, there is a vial of ice fish blood right next to a vial of, like, other fish blood. Worst shooters ever. Terrible. Wow. <laughs> it, that's their blood. That's what it looks like. There is no hemoglobin. And those are the gills there, B and C, between... That's right. This is the, the gills of the ice fish. These are the gills of, like, what, your goldfish. What would that uh, larval stage, the <laughs> clumping larval stage of the muscle thing, be like, <laughs> what the what? what? Okay. So, here's what it looks like from an evolutionary perspective. More trees, more trees! We have a whole bunch of fish that do live in the Southern Ocean. This is the Antarctic clade of nautothenoides. And it is monophyletic. And it is monophyletic. And then we have a whole bunch of traits that appear and disappear on this. Looking right here, hemoglo these are the ice fish right here. Okay, so all of these fish are also living in the same environment. And these fish don't have hemoglobin, nothing. Not even a gene. Should we explain what the AFTP is? Uh, this is antifreeze glycoproteins. So they all have antifreeze glycoproteins. And we've kind of talked about those things. Except for these ones. Because <laughs> they lost <laughs> because them. Because they Cause... lost them. And they're all living together in the very cold water. Bananas. So there's your attention to the ice fish. And... Don't worry about this. It's, it's but basically, of, it is like a catastrophic gene loss. It's kind of how they've, it's how they've lost it. So yeah. this is the accumulation. So as, as they lost those functional bits, which is what the top drawing is, cartoon mm -hmm. is showing, the bit that they're transcribing becomes more and more nonsense yeah. and smaller and so less costly to reproduce. We've talked about this a number of times again and again. This is another example of trait loss. Because if you've lost the function, why keep transcribing and building the architecture? Okay, so it's not like they can get it back. 
it's gone. So Catastrophic in the, in loss. In that, if you line up those families in the top, the phylogeny at the the very top, they can do it, and the bot they can do it, they can do it, they can do it, <laughs> and into the bottom. Even with that weirdly long one, the Ainoa, they can't. No. It's garbage. It's gobbledygook. Amazing. Okay, no hem. So let, let's just go back to this. No hemoglobin. <laughs> <laughs> no red blood cells. Hemoglobin gene has been lost. This is a WIF, what the ice fish moment. How do we explain this? What? Ice what? fish? Okay. That's how what, do, the, what how the Norwegians do, would have said when they discovered it. <laughs> how do we explain this? This is like, so this observation launched massive research projects, right? Because I'm sure you can start thinking like Walt Disney was all about like, what? I can like freeze my head and my blood? Or, you know, like it was just like a big deal, right? How do we figure out um, how we can use this innovation, this technology, right? My area of research is biomimetics. Biomimetics people, people were trying to figure out like nature inspired solutions for technology. We're all over this, pouring lots and lots of money into this feature of the fish so that we could learn from it and we could, you know, use it, right? Mm. Okay. What the ice fish. So for example, papers like this came out. Uh, Antarctic ice fish genome reveals adaptations to extreme environments, right? Yeah? Okay. D does anybody have any, like, what about kind of questions? Mostly the what about questions are so far about Walt Disney. Oh, yay. <laughs> Walt Disney was, yeah, a, it's a whole other thing. Um, okay. Um... No oxygen on Mars. Good. Okay. True. So papers like this coming out in How nature. How do they move oxygen around? How do they fuel yeah, metabolism? Yeah, super good. Okay. Yeah. These are the important questions, right? So, you know, if they're not using hemoglobin, what are they using and how much does it cost? Yay. Oh, yeah. Climate change could really mess these guys up. Super good. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. What about if it's not this super adaptation, right? So remember, there are a whole bunch of other fish that do not have this feature that are living in the same environment also doing well. So it's not a requirement, right? Like the hemoglobin of the mammoth, the other Arctic mammals have a very similar adaptation because it seems to be a bit of a requirement in order to live in the Arctic. In the Antarctic, this is the only group of fishes that have this like totally bananas thing. What if it's non-adaptive? What if instead of being constrained by the environment such that you evolve an adaptation like the woolly mammoth, your environment is facilitating maladaptive traits? The reason why well, it could be because the environment is pretty darn good for the ice fish in that moment. So if hemoglobin loss is not adaptive, or even if it's just costly, how could the trait become common? What evolutionary mechanisms might be involved? And what role does the environment play? Any thoughts? On any of those three questions in any the chat. Any of those things in put, the chat. Put them in the cat. Yep. Yeah. More dissolved oxygen in cold water. So no hey, need to efficiently transport. Yes. That is a... There is more dissolved oxygen in cold water. Absolutely. Yep. That's a great idea. Yep. And a great observation. Yep. And it links nice. back to some of the other... Super yes. good. Bottleneck effect. Yes. Yep. Temporarily empty niche. Totally possible. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Yeah, it works less efficiently in the cold, so might as well explore other options. Cool. Yep. <laughs> and it will still be costly to make. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good, good. These are these are really important observations or contributions to try to get to an answer. Um, there could be many different answers, right? It just so happens that we think we understand what the answer is to this one. So remember, in a different fish, a different context, it could be a different answer. Um, 
when bad things happen to good fish. Okay. So, which is the actual paper, which is amazing. Amazing. Okay. So the idea is that it's entirely possible and likely that the ice fish population experienced an extreme bottleneck effect whereby a mutation or two or three that resulted in the loss of hemoglobin was disproportionately represented in that population but it didn't kill those individual fish like it would totally kill us small body size too there we go yep. uh, because the environment was so oxygen rich anyway that it could get oxygen due to like osmosis right which has to do with their small body size. Which has to do Which with their small body you, size. You're, you're totally like bringing yeah. this along, right? See, science needs to be done as a team because teams come up with the answers together. We can do it. 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 Okay. So, so this is the story, right? And it's, it's, it's a bonkers story because like a whole bunch of things had to happen, right? Remember we said that they have high blood volume. They have huge hearts. They have to pump way more blood around their body in order to be able to like take the oxygen out of their blood without the carrier molecule, right? So it's a hugely inefficient system, which is why it hasn't evolved as an adaptation, but it has evolved as a maladaptation with subsequent adaptations to make it a little bit better because the environment was facilitating this. It was a facilitator. And so the observation, that these guys would be totally screwed in the context of climate change is so accurate yeah. because one or two degree temperature change and all of this falls apart because the oxygen will not be in as high a concentration in warmer water. So we used a phrase there that we, I don't think I've used to date called maladaptation, maladaptive. maladaptive. So evolution, sometimes we've talked about it before, not proceeding towards the greatest efficiency, just stumbling along and achieving good enough better than other things on hand and this is a case where there are elements of that matrix that choice matrix of traits and organisms and the environment where it's it's sometimes not the thing that you think it's apparently maladaptive it's yeah. not adaptive so there's this like expression right surely this is the best of all possible worlds and it don't, don't call me Shirley. Shirley. Shirley, this is the best of all possible wor worlds. So it, it kind of like we want it to be adaptive, right? We want it to be this incredible story of adaptation. We, you, you've been to bars in the before times with people who do this kind of thing, the, the just so stories. Where That's they're right. like, right, so this happened, right, and then that happened. And it was for this reason and that reason. Yeah, That's right. And sometimes you want to slow down and go... Really? Or, or, or. <laughs> exactly. And this is an or story that is delightful. Okay. I hope, I hope you like ice fish now. And, and it's not only about the mammoths. I hope you like ice fish. Um, so here exact is where we're now starting to like explore these alternatives, these different ideas, right? Um, all of these Italians. That's right. So unique adaptations to the cold. Um, yeah, there, there are some, um, uh, certainly with the other fish. Uh, there are these unique adaptations to losing all of your hemoglobin. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what? And if we're not talking about hemoglobin, we're just talking about like, you know, the way that they breed or the way that they eat. For sure, there are these unique adaptations to the cold. Adap like living in a cold environment requires adaptations across all of your systems, right? But... Um, there does seem to be some shallow genetic variation, which definitely speaks to past fluctuations in population size. I hope you're thinking bottleneck, right? Low population connectivity. What does that mean when we talk about population connectivity? What is not happening when a population is not connected? It's not connecting. It's not connecting. They're What's not the word? Sharing. They're not sharing their Sharing genes. is caring. Right. No gene flow. Okay, so we're talking about now the opportunity for more speciation, things Wait like this. A Wait a second. Did you in this, have we in this abstract just linked evolution, ecology, and physiology? This is almost like the kind of thing that you might expect to see in a topic test. Right? What? Okay, which is totally why we shouldn't have courses that are on these discrete topics because like it's all connected. It's all the things. Okay, good. Okay, so 
read this, and if you would like... Read it. To, read it now. Read it no, no, no. For homework. Read it, read it later. If you would like to check out your sort of comprehension of it, the implications... Um, oh. Go back. Two seconds. Go back. Yeah. So it's I put it in the chat, but it's just so that it's here for those of you who are maybe watching this later on and not uh, checking out the chat. And it's a reminder that all of these mastheads of the papers, you see how the cursor changes to the little pointy arrow? These are linked. So if these things interest you, if you actually want to go to the literature, click on it when you get the PDF later. And in fact, this is the last aside. This is a book by an evolutionary biologist named Sean Carroll who writes kind of popular evolutionary stories. And in this one, Great Adventures in the Search for Evolution, one of the chapters is about the ice fish. Uh, so you can buy the book. Maybe some of you already have it. But the chapter about ice fish is, if you click on that, you can read it. Oh, amazing. Okay, we totally should have put this slide after this one because this I'm is sorry. a question that links to... Wah, I'm sorry. Wah, wah. No, 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 it's all good. So um, so we will <laughs> rearrange them for the PDF that we will post. I will do it right now. Right now. It is done. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so here's a question that links to that small abstract that you can use to kind of test your understanding of the implications and all of that stuff. And then... Yay. So, more <laughs> tables. 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 <laughs> okay, mammoth. We told you a story about mammoths. We told you a story about ice fish. We, we, we're talking specifically about the hemoglobin molecule relative to these two groups. Um, and then we have some questions for you and some like time scales, biological levels of organization. Some of these things are going to be exactly the same and some of them are going to be completely different, right? We want you to kind of use these different rows to kind of better understand all of what we just did and so we expect that you might need to watch this again so hopefully the audio works this time okay can, can you hear us now <laughs> take care everyone what was the name of the book again oh. uh, it's in the chat i'll put it in the chat into the jungle okay we did it we did it we can do 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 it